Professor Papasham. I think now it's your time and uh, to address something that we usually say it's very important. And then we jump immediately to pharmacological treatment when dealing with people with diabetes. You want to say non pharmacological treatment is the base, is the key element, is the key element for, of success. But then we'll start immediately discussing what's the role of new therapies, of everything, and forget about it. So I think you'll have a difficult task to convince ourselves of the relevance of non-pharmacological treatment. So it's your time now for that. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, not in presentation mode, but we can see it. Yeah. Second. Yeah, perfect. Is it now? Yeah. Hello. Uh, I think it's uh, already uh, good afternoon there. Here it's still good morning. Uh, greetings from UK. I'm Papson Joseph, one of the consultants in endocrinology in Lancashire Teaching Hospitals. Uh, thanks to the IDF team for having me invited to this talk uh, on uh, diet and exercises uh, for uh, management of uh, diabetes and probably for prevention. This is my disclaimer. Um, I will go through a few slides regarding dietary and exercise management uh, interventions for type 2 diabetes mellitus, after which I'll just uh, quickly scan through a few slides uh, on management of type 1 diabetes and then we can have an interactive uh, uh, question uh, in between the type 1 and uh, a couple of questions after uh, uh, type 1 diabetes uh, discussion. If you have any burning questions, just uh, please make sure that you note it down uh, or uh, text it uh, during the presentation. And uh, we can have a chat about that after the uh, initial 30 minutes of slide presentation in a 10 minutes uh, discussion session. Is type 2 diabetes mellitus a behavioral Disorder. This is the uh, title for one of our most recent uh, uh, publications. Although we can't uh, consider uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus as a behavioral disorder, behavioral interventions has uh, got a, a lot of importance uh, in the uh, prevention and management of uh, type 2 diabetes uh, mellitus. That's why I thought I'll just quickly scan through a few slides uh, regarding this intervention. I always wondered why those monkeys behind uh, chase the man uh, walking in front. Uh, you can see his back is quite bent forward. So it's just like he's trying to straighten his back to become the uh, Homo erectus uh, around half a million years ago. It took another quarter of a million years uh, to become the, the hunter-gatherer uh, modern man. However, it took only uh, only, only uh, half a century to bend the back again because of the obesity pandemic. It is a huge health problem across the globe with more than 30% of individuals in the Western world and probably a significant proportion in Saudi Arabia also affected with obesity. Another 30% uh, uh, so that more than two thirds of the world population is unhealthy because of the uh, obesity pandemic across the globe. This is going to cause huge health hazard in every domain of uh, uh, human life. And there are a myriad of uh, complications related to obesity, uh, somewhat around 50 complications, uh, named complications. The most important one is uh, diabetes mellitus type 2. So what causes the problem with uh, uh, obesity? It's basically the imbalance between your uh, energy homeostasis and uh, uh, weight regulation. So if you consume more energy than uh, you spend on a daily basis, that results in obesity. So we have a basal metabolic rate, which is uh, important for our uh, organ functions. In females, around 1,200 to 1,400 calories a day. And in males, around 1,400 to 1,700 or 800 calories a day for the resting metabolism. 
Anything more than that is uh, from our uh, activities of daily living and probably exercise. So a normal human adult should consume around 2,000 calories, maybe up to 2,500 calories to maintain a healthy uh, life balance, which includes uh, fat, carbohydrates, proteins, and a little bit of salt to have a healthy nutritional pattern. If we consume more than what we need, naturally that will result in health issues, including type 2 diabetes and obesity. For example, uh, if the base, uh, the basal metabolic rate, uh, average basal metabolic rate in human being is between 1,300 to 1,600 calories a day. And if we consume more than that, that will result in ill health and probably obesity. Moreover, as we grow older, the metabolism slows down. For example, in a 60 to 74 years old individual, uh, there's a 122 calories less uh, consumption on basis compared to a young adult at the age of uh, 20 to 35 years. So consequences of uh, uh, obesity and metabolic ill health uh, uh, is usually from uh, excess uh, energy consumption than we, we uh, spend on daily basis. Therefore, obesity is a uh, consequence of uh, uh, energy imbalance. If you spend your energy and eat healthy, you will not become obese. And if you don't uh, spend energy sitting and eating most of the time, it will definitely result in obesity. And if you consume uh, 115 calories a day, cumulative in a month, uh, it will result in expenditure of uh, 3,500 calories. It means one pound of stored fat is likely to develop. This stored fat in various organs and tissues, uh, especially the visceral tissues, will result uh, in inflammation of the adipose tissues, resulting in insulin resistance and disease uh, process, including uh, development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, this is a, a, a representation of uh, various diseases uh, in relation to obesity. You can see a lot of symptoms in every organ systems, and type 2 diabetes is one of the most important complications of uh, obesity. We categorize uh, obesity according to the body mass index. Uh, and there are different classes, as you all know, the class one, class two, and class three obesity, depending on the body mass index, based on the Western statistics. However, you have to bear in mind that adiposity uh, can be different in different ethnic groups. Uh, for example, in Asians, uh, anything uh, more than 25, uh, 23 uh, kilograms per meter squared uh, body mass index is overweight, and anything more than 27.5 is uh, obesity. Uh, I'm sure the Saudi population also may have uh, this kind of adiposity, so that uh, uh, we have to be uh, mindful about the consequences of obesity, even with lesser uh, body mass index. The management of obesity and type 2 diabetes, uh, there are four types of different interventions. The most important of which is uh, dietary changes and exercises. And if they fail, you have to go for pharmacotherapy or in extreme situations, bariatric procedures. Of course, even uh, with pharmacotherapy and uh, after bariatric procedures, unless you comply with the uh, physical interventions, it will result in worsening of the uh, obesity and diabetes mellitus. Therefore, management of obesity is very important in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, and uh, we have to approach these patients as cases of diabetes, basically diabetes resulting from obesity. And any weight loss interventions should be helpful in improvement of diabetes. For example, if you lose uh, 5 to 10% of uh, weight, it will improve the risk of uh, uh, development of type 2 diabetes and management of diabetes uh, mellitus, along with a lot of other health conditions, including cardiovascular disease, improvement of uh, lipid profile, blood pressure, sleep apnea, and improvement of quality of life. There are different dietary interventions, as you can see from the uh, flow chart. Uh, different dietary protocols, mainly uh, uh, going into two types, calorie-restricted diet and time-restricted uh, eating pattern. And in calorie restriction, there are different uh, forms of uh, restriction of macronutrient intake in the form of low-calorie diet, very low-calorie diet, or fasting-mimicking diet. Whereas time-restricted eating, you have intermittent fasting or uh, time-restricted uh, eating uh, behavior at a particular uh, uh, point of uh, time uh, in the uh, 
in a, in a, in a, in a narrow uh, eating window uh, between four to 12 hours. Different dietary interventions have different effects. Of course, uh, all have beneficial effects. Uh, for example, uh, this is the fat-restricted diet uh, with significant improvement of body weight and probably diabetes improvement, uh, uh, Mediterranean diet, and a low-carbohydrate, of which low-carbohydrate uh, diet is probably having slightly better benefit, but all these dietary interventions will have their effect uh, in management of obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, we have reduced our fi fiber intake over the past few decades uh, with uh, less than two-thirds of the recommended uh, fiber intake we consume in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, diet. We have to increase uh, the fiber intake at least by 50% to improve the metabolic health and management of diabetes. This picture shows uh, various forms of uh, low-calorie diet uh, in the, in the uh, uh, plates you can see. Um, it's difficult to get all these items on a day-to-day -day basis, but at least try to uh, be as healthy as possible uh, and, uh, and, and recommend your patients to have a healthy diet like this. Various uh, dietary interventions uh, in the short term, uh, for example, Atkins diet, Sohn diet, Weight Watchers or Ornish diet, all these have a good beneficial effect without much uh, discrepancy in their uh, effect in the immediate period. Uh, for uh, about 12 months, but uh, looking forward uh, in the long run, that will probably uh, worsen because of the lack of adherence of various dietary patterns. Mm -hmm. Chrononutrition uh, is a pattern of uh, nutrient intake during a particular uh, uh, period of day. Uh, we all have a biological clock system, which is very uh, well balanced. And if we don't, uh, if we disturb the biological clock system, and the circadian uh, rhythm uh, with the disorganized uh, eating pattern that will result in diabetes development and uh, uh, obesity development. Whereas if we synchronize the uh, dietary pattern uh, according to the biological clock, that will improve the metabolic health and probably help diabetes patients. Uh, these are the types of uh, time-restricted eating behavior. Uh, you can suggest early uh, time-restricted eating between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., noon to late uh, evening, or the participant choice time-restricted eating pattern. And this is a graphical uh, schematic representation of time-restricted eating intervention and how it benefits. If you look at this graph, uh, you can see the uh, uh, time period we sleep, usually eight hours or uh, seven to nine hours uh, a day. And we have to avoid uh, eating uh, two to three hours prior to going to bed and to avoid uh, bright light to ensure that our biological clock is not disturbed. Ideally, uh, the patients should not eat uh, at least for uh, one hour after waking up and the, the eating period uh, should ideally be uh, a 10 hour period uh, during the day. And there should be some light uh, to moderate exercise uh, during the period to help uh, the time-restricted eating uh, related health benefits. If we don't follow this system, uh, most of the Western population, uh, uh, they eat uh, maybe 12 to 14 hours a day. That results in metabolic syndrome and development of obesity and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Whereas restriction of eating uh, to less than 10 hours will improve the metabolic profile and help uh, diabetes management. Uh, the American classical diet uh, or, or uh, lifestyle, uh, people eat uh, for 12 hours or more, whereas early time-restricted uh, eating between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m. has shown to improve blood pressure, improve insulin sensitivity, uh, uh, beta cell function, uh, reduce postprandial insulin levels, and oxidative stress and appetite. Uh, how does uh, the uh, time restricted eating uh, behavior help. There is a period of uh, dietary energy restriction, which causes a depletion of glycogen stores in the liver. The liver stores glycogen for about 12 hours. Uh, so if you don't eat for 12 hours, that will result in a metabolic switching, which improves the cell adaptation to cell uh, uh, the stress resistance and uh, uh, reduction of insulin signaling and overall protein synthesis. On recovery from fasting, 
for example, uh, when we eat and uh, sleep, the glucose levels uh, increase again and the ketone levels uh, plummet. Uh, cells uh, increase protein synthesis undergoing uh, growth and repair. It will help to maintain uh, 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 good health uh, and especially with uh, uh, some intermittent exercises to improve your uh, mental health, physical health and uh, improvement of uh, disease uh, resistance. However, we have to bear in mind that uh, time-restricted eating behavior is not appropriate in certain uh, population groups such as growing children and teenagers, type 1 diabetics and uh, uh, type 2 diabetic patients on uh, insulin and uh, oral uh, agents, severe illness, eating uh, disorders, pregnancy, lactation, uh, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, and cancers. This is an exercise program uh, which I have developed. Uh, it is available on YouTube. Let me try whether we can get into that. Uh, it's a uh, 30 minutes uh, exercise program which uh, uh, patients and uh, uh, we can practice to improve your uh, metabolic health. Uh, a lot of stretching activities. I think the net is slightly slow. It's opening up. Unfortunately, net is quite slow here uh, with the Wi-Fi connection. Right. It's not opening up, uh, sorry. Um, uh, you can see that on, online uh, in the resources I have provided you earlier. Uh, so what happens during exercise? Uh, the, the brain sends signals to the muscles uh, for contraction, and it also sends signals to the kidneys and the liver to produce glucose a fuel supply to the muscles. And when muscles contract, uh, the energy is consumed and muscles send signals to the liver as well as uh, adipose tissue uh, for increased fuel supply. Uh, and muscles also produce a lot of myokines, which improves the adipocyte uh, biology, including adipocyte browning, which improves the metabolic health and obesity reduction. Uh, this is the uh, pattern of uh, exercise. Uh, uh, so if we uh, comply to the international uh, recommendations for exercise uh, practice, uh, about 150 minutes of moderate intensity uh, exercise will help. For example, it's walking uh, at a uh, speed of 3.5 miles per hour, will help to uh, spend around 875 calories a week. If you add on two sessions of strength training uh, with moderate uh, volume intens and intensity, it will help another 220 calories. So overall, around 1,100 calories uh, per week uh, with the exercise program. However, if you take two full glassfuls of uh, coffee with milk and uh, sugar, all this uh, uh, become wasted. Although you have to bear in mind that the, the benefit of exercise is not just uh, uh, spend, expenditure of calories, but it has other uh, cardiovascular benefits. So exercise is very important. Therefore, we have to always combine dietary interventions with exercise to improve the metabolic health and treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Going to a case scenario, this is the story of a 38-year-old Caucasian lady diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus in 2019, having history of uh, gestational diabetes mellitus in her last pregnancy, has a BMI of uh, 34.6 with an excess body weight of 20 kilograms. Her metabolic control is inadequate with HbA1c of 8.2 percentage uh, on full doses of citagliptin and metformin, and she has uh, features of metabolic syndrome in the form of hypertension and uh, dyslipidemia. Unfortunately, she has uh, joint pains and can't do much exercises. What behavioral interventions uh, can be made to help her? Just to take uh, maybe a few uh, seconds, maybe 30, 40 seconds to have your ideas, and we have a uh, chat about that later. Right? 
This patient uh, agreed to lose about 10 kilograms body weight in one, two years time uh, with dietary energy restriction uh, through a dietitian advice to have uh, a diet, which is uh, 1,000 uh, to 1,200 calories a day. She also agreed to swim uh, once her knee joint pain is better with analgesia. And if these interventions do not work, then go for injection therapy with GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. The problem of uh, management of uh, diabetes and uh, obesity through uh, health, uh, uh, the, the in, uh, lifestyle interventions is the problem with maintenance of the benefit. Uh, for example, most of the clinical trials, you can see a lot of clinical trials showing uh, immediate benefit uh, in a period of a few months to a year or two, but later all the maintenance uh, of the benefits uh, wean off uh, because uh, adherence will not be uh, adequate. The largest clinical trial, one of the largest clinical trials is look-ahead trials, which showed uh, a significant benefit of weight uh, loss. Uh, on average, 8.6% uh, of weight loss uh, in a period of one year compared to uh, diet and uh, uh, the standard uh, uh, therapy. But uh, at the end of eight years, the mean weight loss uh, has come down to 4.7%. Though you have to bear in mind that a significant proportion of 27% of people lost more than 10% of body weight, uh, and some of the early diabetics would have uh, uh, resulted uh, in uh, diabetes remission even with that weight loss. However, you have to bear in mind that over time, the diabetes control uh, became very poor, uh, as you can see from the graph. Therefore, we have to always bear in mind that we have to adopt a multi-prong approach to improve diabetes management. You should always combine intense behavioral interventions with drug therapy when necessary, a multi-prong approach to improve diabetes. And that's why we have to approach patients with type 2 diabetes as management of diabetes, basically obesity-related diabetes. So, there should be uh, uh, intervention by uh, appropriate lifestyle changes, including medical nutrition therapy and behavioral modification to do regular exercises. And if they do not work, revisit and intensify the treatment along with your medical therapy. And if these interventions do not work, you have to consider anti-obesity medications and probably uh, bariatric procedures if nothing else work, especially in uh, presence of uh, class two and class three obesity. That's about uh, type two diabetes, uh, going on to dietary and exercise interventions for uh, type one diabetes mellitus. We all go for uh, the Daphne program for patients with uh, new onset uh, type one diabetes. Those adjustments uh, for normal eating because uh, most of the type one diabetics are uh, young individuals, you can't restrict their eating behavior significantly. So you have to uh, adopt a, a, a lifestyle as well as uh, uh, pharmacological intervention in the form of uh, Daphne uh, program. So patients should know uh, that there are three different types of cycles in the Daphne program. The routine management involves regular uh, blood sugar checking, uh, looking at their physical activity and the adjustment of insulin doses and plan appropriate diet uh, and uh, uh, insulin ratio in the form of uh, carbohydrate counting and implement the uh, treatment program and revisit whenever it is necessary. The reactive management involves uh, hypoglycemia management when patient develops a hypo, identify the cause for hypo and always treat it appropriately and recheck the blood sugar. And again, uh, think about uh, what's the cause of hypo and solve the problem which caused the hypo and uh, reflect on the current management plan and uh, implement the right management plan again to uh, change the insulin carbohydrate ratio to appropriately manage uh, the diabetes. Uh, the reflective management is periodic review of the data of uh, uh, glucose control and plan uh, the appropriate strategy to uh, prevent hypos. Uh, exercise program should be taken care of. And again, check the glucose targets, uh, solve any problem uh, if it is uh, present, and then plan the new strategy for patient management. So this is a behavioral intervention along with uh, your uh, 
insulin management for patients with type 1 diabetes, especially because they are all, uh, most of them are uh, young individuals with regular physical activity and uh, erratic eating patterns. Case scenario two uh, is a 32-year-old Chinese uh, gentleman. He's a software professional, uh, mostly sedentary in front of his computer. Diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2015, uh, having uh, inadequate control, HbA1c is 8.4 percentage, uh, high insulin carbohydrate ratio, and high uh, basal insulin at night. He has been gaining weight gradually with increasing BMI and higher uh, carbohydrate insulin ratio. What behavioral interventions can be made to help this man? Have a quick think about this uh, problem. You can make plans and we can have a chat about this later. Right. This is the case scenario. I said a uh, 32 year old type 1 uh, diabetic with uh, relatively high BMI and high insulin requirements. The problem with insulin insulin being an anabolic hormone, which will result in uh, development of adiposity unless we restrict the uh, dietary energy intake. This adipose tissue expansion will result in uh, formation of a lot of adipokines and cytokines, which, sorry. Uh, which causes insulin resistance to cause uh, more gluconeogenesis from the uh, liver, more glucagon production from the pancreas, and it may result in fat accumulation uh, in the uh, uh, muscle, increasing the insulin uh, demand. It will result in inflammation and atherogenesis, increasing the cardiovascular risk in these patients with the development of dual diabetes. That means type 1 diabetes with insulin resistance or uh, a, a behavior like type 2 diabetes with high insulin requirement. Uh, probable interventions could be a dietitian referral uh, for designing a meal pattern with uh, weight loss, uh, aiming low carbohydrate, uh, high fiber diet, motivation to do some regular structured exercise program, revising the insulin dose needs, depending on uh, a prompt uh, glucose uh, diary maintenance, an online app, and also weight loss achieved through uh, the above measures could help this gentleman. Many of the young individuals uh, after uh, diagnosis of type 1 diabetes still wants to do exercises and some of your patients uh, may be uh, an athlete uh, or uh, athletic, uh, those who want to do regular athletic training. So there are different forms of uh, uh, exercise training uh, available for uh, patients with type 1 diabetes. One form is faster training. Uh, patients uh, don't take any food prior to exercise and skip the short acting insulin which may improve the metabolic profile, but there's a risk of moderate risk of hypoglycemia. Some of the individuals do twice daily exercise training, morning and evening, and they may have uh, low glucose when they go to bed, uh, skipping the nighttime dose of uh, short acting insulin, and uh, uh, they may also help uh, the metabolic adaptations, but at a high risk of uh, hypo uh, overnight. Because your exercising muscles use the stored uh, muscle glycogen, uh, depleting the glycogen stores. So there's not much of uh, energy stored in uh, muscles. And uh, when uh, you go to bed, uh, you'll have uh, low glucose levels uh, and you have to adjust insulin doses. Some people do exercise in the morning and uh, uh, before uh, evening. So that, and they, they may go with the lower glucose level at uh, uh, night. Uh, so the risk is a uh, high risk of hypoglycemia overnight uh, because of uh, low muscle glycogen and stored glucose in the tissues. We have another case scenario. This is the story of a 24-year-old Afro-Caribbean male diagnosed with type 1 diabetes mellitus in 2020. Good metabolic control with an HbA1 of 6.4 percentage and uh, normal uh, insulin carbohydrate counting ratio with low basal insulin levels at night. He develops regular hypoglycemia following uh, jogging in the evening. And what kind of interventions can be made to help him? Just have a quick thought of uh, this uh, scenario uh, in next 30 to 40 seconds, and then we can go on to the discussion.
right? There's no uh, clear cut answer for this kind of situations. You have to devise uh, diabetes regime uh, according to the uh, patient uh, uh, clinical scenario and the uh, requirement. So uh, we have to consider giving him a, a carbohydrate containing snack prior to the exercise uh, if the glucose level is uh, less than nine to 12 millimoles. Just trial and error. That's how we have to manage uh, these kind of patients. And we have to empower the patients because each type 1 diabetic, not only type 1 diabetic, any diabetic or any patient, it's a unique individual. You have to tailor a regime appropriate to his uh, or her uh, clinical scenario. You can consider changing the lunchtime insulin carbohydrate ratio uh, to keep the evening uh, glucose somewhere between 9 to 12 prior to the exercise, or consider the exercise program 1 to 2 hours uh, post-meal uh, in the evening uh, with careful monitoring of uh, uh, glucose levels. To conclude, we all need to ensure that we lead a healthy lifestyle by appropriate uh, diet and exercise, and we encourage our patients to adopt a lifestyle which involves proper nutrition uh, to avoid metabolic ill health and regular exercise programs to improve diabetes management and also the, the metabolic control and the cardiovascular complications as has been discussed in the previous sessions and they should not be eating to death. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Papachan. <laughs> Great presentation. I think you'll have right. opportunities to discuss. You can stop sharing the slide if you... Yeah, I have a few questions. I'll just share it now. Just give me a second. I think if you send the questions for the quiz, they will be sent centrally. Oh, all right. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Good. Yeah, so just, so I think we can move to the quiz, please, from the technical support team. Just a moment, sir. Okay, perhaps. While they are trying to put the quiz, perhaps I can ask you a question about your last. Ah, I think we'll have the questions now. Okay, so go ahead. So people can scan the QR code. Again, go to Mentimeter. And we'll see how many people registered now. Please do your scanning. I don't see no. I don't see people with the QR code there. And the QR code of getting it on. Yes. For the sake of time, perhaps we can go to the to the questions immediately. So this is the case scenario I mentioned earlier. You can have a quick read. So let can me you go to the answer? Yes. Yeah. Window, it's quite warm here.
Okay, perhaps we can close the, the voting. And Professor Papachan, do you like to comment on the answers? <laughs> I think uh, most of the audience uh, voted uh, appropriately. It's uh, uh, a calorie restriction between 1,000 to 1,200 uh, calories a day. Uh, because uh, patients, uh, if at all, they want to lose weight quickly, it's uh, difficult to achieve that goal. So you have to be realistic. Uh, it's uh, ideally uh, over a, a, a slightly longer term period, one to two years time. And if they don't work, you have to go for the uh, next option, like uh, pharmacological intervention. But uh, this is a, a good case scenario. Okay, next slide, please. Right, this is the answer, the correct answer, patient uh, agreed. Basically, we are dealing with the diabetes in this case, as I mentioned in the previous slides, okay? Uh -huh. Right, next question is, uh, what is the average energy needs uh, for basal metabolism in an adult with normal body weight? So there are more divergences here. We close the voting and then go to the uh, answers. Basically, the correct answer is 1,300 to 1,600 calories. The so basal metabolism, not the total energy expenditure. I think that confuses some of the audience. All right, okay. Next question, please. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, basal metabolism. We can see uh, resting metabolism is around 1,200 to 400 in uh, a female and 1,400 to 700 or 800 in a male. All right, next slide, please. So a normal diet of an adult should contain around uh, 2,000 calories, maybe slightly more than that, uh, which involves uh, different uh, macronutrients as shown in the slide. Next slide. What is the energy expenditure per week when one performs moderate physical activity recommended by most professional bodies? We discussed in one of the slides earlier. Moderate physical activity. Again, here also there is no uh, absolute answer. All answers can be correct, but the most appropriate is uh, 1,100 calories. Next slide, please. Right, uh, this is uh, the slide uh, uh, which I've uh, mentioned earlier. So uh, at 3.5 miles per hour walk, uh, average 100 calories uh, per mile over a period of seven days uh, will help to lose around 875 uh, uh, calories and two sessions of strength training. That's also uh, important because your muscles needs to get uh, uh, healthier. So which uh, is around 1,100 uh, or 1,095 calories. All right, next slide, please. In which situations a time-restricted eating pattern shall be appropriate?
Right. I think good uh, proportion of uh, people voted correctly. It's uh, a, a type 2 diabetes on diet control because uh, children and uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, time-restricted eating behavior may not be appropriate. Those patients can have problems. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are the situations where uh, time-restricted eating behavior is uh, inappropriate uh, in type 1 diabetics and those on insulin, especially type 2 diabetic. Uh, growing children, acute illness, and various uh, other disorders as shown in the slide. Next slide, please. So case scenario two, a uh, Chinese uh, gentleman, uh, software professional with uh, inadequate activity, high insulin requirements, and inadequate metabolic control. Gradual weight gain uh, and uh, increased BMI and high carbohydrate counting ratio. What interventions? Next slide. Next slide. What kind of behavioral interventions can help this uh, gentleman to improve his metabolic health? Professor Russell uh, offline will be finding it difficult to read. That's a small letters. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, if you agree with me, perhaps we can, because those, this is about type one and we are mainly discussing type two on, on this uh, workshop, if you wouldn't mind. And we left, we are running a little short on time. And perhaps All right, we can, okay. I think we uh, can conclude. And if there's any questions, uh, I'm happy to yeah, take it. That would be great if we can now move on to the question and answer part. And because that will be seeing a opportunity. So perhaps we can I, stop I think, sharing uh, the Mentimeter now. Yeah. And then questions from the room about lifestyle and i can just ask you one while they, they're preparing there but because you mentioned perfectly the the need to do have structure interventions considering the weight loss on physical activity with with eating patterns but then at the end you just said it's a question of healthy lifestyle something that i wrote here and and so i think we are always giving a kind of mixed message to the community to say with diabetes, it's like healthy lifestyles. But then, actually, when people already have type 2 diabetes, it's just not exactly healthy lifestyle. We have to do more to lose the weight, to, to go back to the, to the starting point. So what do you think about this mixed message content on it's just healthy lifestyle? Or should we be really taking care of how we eat and trying to do, to do it in a different way? And sometimes it's quite different from the rest of the family because people are really to go on caloric restriction, time restriction pattern. So what's it's really healthy or it's an interventional, a nutritional intervention? Basically, it should be intense uh, lifestyle intervention. Uh, why they become diabetic? That's why. That's why uh, uh, one of our uh, recent works we we put it like: Is it a behavioral disorder? By changing the behavioral pattern. Uh, to modify a healthy lifestyle, which probably prevents diabetes. And uh, most of the type 2 diabetes, unfortunately, they will say that, oh, I am taking the right diet, I'm taking this and that. And if you ask the patients to maintain a food diary and their activity diary, they will come and say, oh, doctor, I am doing uh, it uh, differently. So it's a good idea. One of, one of my patients uh, lost around, uh, uh, around uh, 30 kilograms, uh, young chap, uh, in uh, six months uh, with intense lifestyle intervention because he became diabetic at the age of 18 years. And he had to, I, I just con continued metformin because his HbA1c was uh, more than eight, but it became less than 6.5 after loss of 30 kilograms body weight. But it's very difficult because uh, most of the modern life, we spent more time in front of computers and probably in front of uh, handheld yeah. devices. Uh, chatting and talking and socializing without much physical activity. So it's appropriate eating, uh, probably energy restriction and uh, uh, the the exercise interventions. Uh, I'm sure if we if we vote in a in a diabetes uh, meeting, uh, uh, vote for the number of people doing daily exercise, the number of hands raised will be very very minimal. Yeah, very well. yeah, okay. I do it because I have a very bad metabolic family history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my parents, both parents, were diabetics for several years, and uh, my elder siblings are diabetics. So I need to postpone type two diabetes, knowing the implication of being a diabetic yeah. and endocrinologist. So I would that's strike fine, to fine, help fine. myself and tell my patients to do that. I was just checking if there were some raised hands on the on the audience on site. There, I think it is. Yes. 
So we'll have a mic there. Yeah, can you hear the question again? Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor, for the informative lecture. Thank you for your time. Um, I know we're running out of time. Would you please, in two or three sentences, emphasize on the different effect of the unrestricted eating on uh, different durations? Like uh, you mentioned, in 10 hours or 12 hours. Is there like a different in effect and a different in the situation for the patient? Thank you so much. I think there's no head to head study of the uh the time intervals between the eating pattern, 8 to 2 a, uh, p.m. or uh, 10 to 6 p.m. I don't think there's a head-to-head -head comparative uh, uh, studies, but all these interventions, basically it's uh, the, the, the number of hours we uh, fast. If it is more than 12 hours, definitely it will be helpful. And if it is extended to maybe 16 hours, 18 hours, that will be better because uh, body has more time for adaptation and uh, uh, the the uh, adipolysis to improve the metabolic health. Um, so I don't think there's any uh, 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 good clinical trial. One of my uh, academic collaborator from India was asking me, oh, I'm now on a uh, time restricted eating and I lost eight kilograms body weight uh, over a past uh, a period of six months. What is the uh, immediate and long-term implications of this uh, uh, intervention? I said, we don't know at the moment. Uh, at the moment, what we know is that there's uh, definitely immediate effects. We don't know the long-term implications because we don't have uh, long-term uh, outcomes from uh, large clinical trials. So that's the problem. But all this type of intervention should help, including intermittent fasting. That's why I think uh, uh, Ramsan period, most of my uh, Muslim patients uh, have their uh, uh, diabetes control much better, especially if we advise them regarding uh, proper change in the dietary behavior and the, the management of uh, uh, their anti-diabetic medications. So that's probably, a, especially in UK, because we have a longer um, dead time uh, during Ramsan period. So the, the number of hours uh, they fast is more uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, unlike in the Middle East. I think there are some more comments on the room. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah there is another question. So Thank you for the comprehensive presentation. Uh, why it is not appropriate to use weight lowering medication such as GLP-1, like dulaglutide or semaglutide in children with type 1 diabetes? What is the harm of these drugs in kids in, with type 1 diabetes? They do not cause hypoglycemia, they, they lower the weight effectively, and they think, I, I, I believe, they are quite uh, uh, beneficial drugs in terms of. Effective weight lowering. Unfortunately, um, there are not uh, much of uh, large randomized controlled trials on the uh, benefit of GLP-1 therapy in type 1 diabetes. Of course, there are a uh, uh, few, uh, but not uh, uh, large scale studies. And most of the professional bodies routinely don't recommend uh, this uh, intervention for type 1 diabetics. But I have patients, of course, with uh, uh, obesity and other metabolic problems uh, having benefit of this. You have to be carefully balancing to avoid hypoglycemia plus or minus uh, ketosis in such patients with the massive insulin dose reduction. Uh, but if you appropriately choose patients, one of the case scenario in the uh, recent published work I shared you with you, uh, the uh, study material is on type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. One of the ladies who lost uh, uh, 20 kilograms uh, with use of uh, liraglutide in type 1 diabetes, and she cut down the insulin doses from 190 units per day to 70 units per day with improvement of HbA1c. But you have to be careful because most of the licensing authorities will not approve if something yeah. goes wrong. You have to be careful, otherwise you'll be uh, penalized. But yeah. there's, of course, uh, it can be used in an individualized basis. Yeah. It's our off-label utilization in any country, I think, at the moment. So any more hands raising? They are in the audience or the Thank comments? you. Let's proceed for the next. Okay. So, may I ask a quick question also about the very low calorie diet? So, and, and in UK, you had that experience of those clinical trials at primary care with meal replacement therapies with very low calorie. What's your opinion versus that time restricted uh, diets? What, are they comparable? At the end, it's always the same or? What do you recommend? 
again, uh, most of this uh, dietary interventions, uh, in my experience, and uh, most of the clinical trials show uh, the sustainability of these interventions. Of course, uh, I don't think there's a head-to-head -head comparison of most of these clinical trials, uh, but uh, each of these interventions should help. For example, one of my patients uh, who went on a no-carb diet, of course, not no-carb, very low-calorie diet, and she lost around uh, uh, eight kilograms, and she came off the diabetes medications for uh, uh, two or three years. But lately, because she's she has become she has been becoming uh, depressed, and then she started eating the normal diet, and then she regained the, all the weight. The sustainability is a main problem, uh, mm -hmm. but I think time restriction is probably uh, uh, worthwhile considering some of the patients, especially those not on multiple uh, anti-diabetic medications. Some of the patients I suggest if they help. I tried myself uh, to see whether that's helping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, it could be difficult uh, if you skip the breakfast and take only lunch uh, uh, occasionally, once a week or something like that. Yeah. Gradually, you can train yourself, and that should be helpful. But uh, I don't think there's a routine recommendation from any professional bodies here also uh, mm -hmm. for implementing such interventions. But definitely, those kind of interventions should help, at least in the immediate period. And of course, uh, as we know, uh, when you change the uh, biological behavior, including eating and exercise, your gut microbiome may change. That should also be helpful uh, in improving the metabolic health. So many of these things are still under investigation. And I think uh, those things should definitely uh, uh, be research questions for future clinical trials and large uh, uh, population-based studies. Okay. Thank you. I've just seen some mics moving there, but I don't think there's a question now. And according to the time, we are again behind. Um, schedule so professor papachan thank you i think we'll try now to do some group activity with the people on site